now you are good. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is the uh, Thursday, March 18th meeting of the Joint Capital Planning Committee, and we are conducting this meeting virtually by orders of the governor because of the COVID um, uh, pandemic. So I, one of the first things I want to do is just make sure the members of the committee can hear and be heard. And I will just call each person by their name and just indicate whether you can hear and be heard. Mandy. Present. Tammy. Present. Alex. Present. Peter. Present. And Andy. Up. Oh, Andy. I'm here. And Carrie has joined us. And Carrie. Present. Okay, so I'm calling the meeting to order, and all members of the committee are here, and we're joined by Sean Magnano and Paul Bachman. Um, tonight, I mean, I think as everyone knows, we're at the um, think through what our recommendations are. Um, any remaining questions we have of presentations and Sean sent us um, an itemized list where we had asked for additional information. And then that's on focusing on the next year budget for capital. And then we also wanted to have a discussion about any thoughts looking at the five-year plan. And I'm hoping there will be time with, after both of those, to just get a little bit input input from people on the format of the report, because this um, we've gotten a lot more information than we had in the past. And I was looking at earlier JCPC reports and just on any thoughts of the way we want to organize, like do we like vehicles all, all being in one section rather than vehicles plus equipment? So it's a short discussion because we're due to have a draft report next week. Um, and I think that is doable if I take the word draft um, meaning draft for a discussion. And if we have to, then there is another week reserved. But if we can get to a close enough draft, we can have a discussion of it. So tonight will be the contents um, of that draft in terms of our recommendations and thoughts of what's going in. So did that cover the basis, Sean, of what we talked about? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think the first thing then is to turn to the recommended capital spending for um, FY22. And um, we have a budget uh, for capital that is matched by the requests rather than being many more millions of requests than we can afford. So I think it's, are any items on the list of concern? Do people want to sing single them out? Remaining questions? And I know you said Jeremiah is going to be joining us to answer some questions. So I am just throwing it open to everyone. Sean has a comment. Um, Kathy, is it okay if I share my screen? Um, I have a Word document and then that, that way everyone can kind of see maybe what we're talking about and we can, um, and I can go over what documents we have available. So if anybody wants us to uh, pull anything up, we can. Is that all right with everyone? So we'll go from seeing everyone's face to seeing a screen? Yes? Alex says definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so hopefully you see my screen. So um, Kathy and I spoke a little bit earlier um, about what would be a productive process for the recommendation discussion. And so we broke it into three parts. So the, the first part um, is sort of these follow-up items that we talked about. And I mean, we don't have to go through all of them, but um, I can give you a quick update on some of them. And then the second part is, are there any changes that, um, I don't know, if this, is this big enough for people to see? Yeah, I, I think I'm seeing heads nodding. Um, the second part is, are there any changes to the plan that um, committee members need in order to, to vote on a recommendation? So are there any you know, anything that, you know, absolutely needs to change either for the FY22 or for the out years. Um, and then the last piece is, you know, what are things that we might, you might want to say as part of a recommendation vote. So maybe you can recommend it at the plan as it is, but, you know, you want um, the town manager to think, you know, maybe we should increase these, um, you know, the chiller project to a, a VFD, um, a VFD, 
model, which might be a little more expensive, or maybe there's something in the out years, you know, the North Amherst intersection came up. So maybe it's, again, we can vote this plan, but you should think about maybe we put, keep pushing that off until maybe a grant is acquired. Um, so, so that was sort of how we were going to structure the discussion. And I have um, the capital improvement document. So if anybody wants to see the actual projects again, and then I also have sort of the workbook. So I know Kathy, you had some more detailed questions, probably when we get more into the farther along in the conversation that I can pull up some of those answers. Is, 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 is that clear to everyone what was recommended here as a way of going through this? And does anybody have any alternatives? I mean, Kathy and I just spoke about it quickly. If anybody disagrees with that approach. So I, I, I think what um, we've just laid out is we had these follow-up items, whether anyone wants um, more information right now, um, besides for Jeremiah, um, or whether we're ready to move from knowing that we've requested this additional information and we can put that information in the report if we have it. Um, and um, then do we wanna then go from this list to looking at um, our recommendations if there are any items in either the coming year or the four, four years after that. So I'm gonna just wait to hear on this list. And this this is a mainly Sean, but he was taking notes as we went along where we were asking questions and they're capturing the minutes um, for either more information, but things like months and what would be the additional cost if we went all the way to mini splits and via and the chiller issue. So we don't have answers to those yet, but that's where we could be making a recommendation to be considering these. So I'm just gonna look around the screen. Mandy's hand is up. Yeah, so thank you. Um, it's kind of related to this one and kind of related to the next one. As I was going back over my notes, you know, some of these say the truck numbers are not consistent, not only between departments, but over years. And then there was one note in the school, one of the school IT budgets that they wanted 194 instead of one, you know, 40 something. Um, so that's additional there. So I guess one of my questions is, is it really 15,000 that we're off this year for FY22? Or do we have to essentially quote, find or cut for more than that? Because I haven't seen an updated sort of five year plan that adjusts those numbers. So I'm not sure where we are on what the actual matching is right now. Yeah, no, that's a good Good point. That, yeah, so I listed those on here as things that need to be fixed or updated before, um, you know, before a final capital improvement program is put together. Um, and you're right about the computers. That'll make the um, gap a little bit bigger. So I think it was like a $45,000 increase or $50,000 increase. Um, and so the question would be, do we go with that? Because that was um, that wasn't what was submitted at the beginning of the process. That was sort of an update that happened that night. Um, so I guess your recommendation could be to go with that, um, which would, would then change how much is it, you know, how much we're over. Um, and if you do want to go with that, it, you, you know, along with that would be, where would we reduce? Um, you know, there's some areas in here where people said they could reduce as well. Um, so talking about where we would maybe offset that. Yeah, Tammy. Sean, did you talk to Sharon about the um, computers? Because it's my understanding they're not part of the um, furnishings list um, with the grant. And even though the library will be closed, it will be open somewhere else. And there yeah, will so be, I, yeah. So I, I emailed Sharon. I haven't heard, um, I emailed Sharon and Sean Hannon. Um, I didn't get a response back yet, but I was gonna, once I find out that answer, then update Yeah, the... Sharon will, she, will be back next week. Okay. Um, okay, because um, it concerns me to to wait when um, they may be needed soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. And T Tammy, could you just ask her when she does that, um, even if some computers are n needed, it's not clear yet, at least as I understand, exactly where you'll be physically sitting. So it may be that while the library is closed, you don't need as many computers. Because, you know, so I just just have her write uh, write in words what the intention is. Is okay. all I'm asking. 
Okay. But there, yeah. there may be a case of where, for instance, they would move more computers to Munson um, for additional services. So I, I think that um, we need to check with her. I'll, I'll, I'll email her. Thank you. Um, Alex's hand is up. Yeah, just to follow up on that, I don't know um, how sort of fast track the North Amherst Library project is going to be, but again, depending on where that is in the process, that's another potential space where we could have a bank of computers. We get a lot of people actually that come over from the Survival Center and other places who wanna use the computers. So I think there's a lot of unknowns for us as a problem. Um, I think to the extent that we can you know, bulk up the branches to allow for more computer usage as well as the temporary spaces. That's sort of one of the key um, issues is digital access for people who don't have digital access. And so um, it's, just, it's not quite as easy as like, we're closed, so we don't need them. I mean, to the extent that we could provide them, we would. So I worry um, about cutting them out because we think we're closed because I don't think that'll be the case. And I don't think we, like, there, there are too many unknowns for us to say, like, I don't know what building we're going to be in. I don't know if the North Amherst Library is going to be closed or open or expanded and have, you know, be twice the size. So I, I just, even if we get an answer from Sharon, my guess is it's not going to be a satisfactory answer. Okay, Sean. So Kathy, this may be a good example of one of the types of things that would be sort of, uh, we recommend the plan and keep this in mind. Um, you know, something for the town manager to keep in mind in those out years. Um, again, not that we would change the plan as it is, but as we get more information to keep in mind that maybe there is room to adjust this number potentially once we get more information. Um, but to, for now, to, to let it be until we get that information. Okay. Um, you, you know, we've got, when you said people said they could reduce, there's one clear, the, the school, um, when Doug was in, he said the copy of budget could be reduced. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he indicated specifically which, but could, if you could check with him, because if that's mm -hmm. offsetting money for the money that Mandy said might add an additional 45, that may, might be a way that we could do without this one. Because one was a big copier and the others were smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he offered reducing it. <laughs> um, that's the one I remember really offering reducing it. Yeah, I think his rationale was they haven't been used as much this year, um, you know, as much as they normally would be. So, yeah, and that 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 they're therefore not about to break the way they otherwise would have been. Peter, yeah, Peter, your hand was up, but now you're muted. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I'll skip the perfunctory apology if I should know how to mute by this point. Um, I guess I just didn't skip. Um, so yeah, as, as we start out here, um, you know, thinking about this year's capital budget, you know, my, uh, I, I would just share that my, my general impression is that I was surprised over the course of the presentations from all of the service departments, including the schools, um, of the lack of, of pain uh, and urgency expressed. Um, I, you know, generally speaking, um, I've I've heard and felt a, a higher level of uh, difficulty on the operational budget side than I have on the capital side, and um, you know, just kind of asking the general questions of could we reduce this, could we reduce that? I didn't hear a ton of pushback, um, uh, and you know, I compare that to uh, some of the really hard discussions we're having on the operational budget side. Um, and and it, it feels, you know, to me like a bit of a disconnect, especially considering the orders of magnitude of, of some of these amounts. You know, we had a, um, even with the increased um, support recently uh, at, the, at the schools, you know, the schools is really, you know, budget I know at a detailed level, um, you know, we're still cutting 372,000 from our, our, our budget. Um, and we had a really long discussion a couple of nights ago about, um, 75,000 of, of those cuts um, they happen to be for, for arts integration at the elementary school. And I, I won't go into the particulars of that, but you know, we spent a really long time on, on 75,000 of, of level services that would probably be a permanent cut, right? Because we don't typically expect an operational budget in the future uh, that's gonna cover inflation and then, and then go above and beyond that such that we could restore 
previous cuts. Um, and as and as Sean has has mentioned several times, you know, next year's budget is going to be extremely lean. Um, so comfortably hundreds of thousands of more more dollars of services cuts. So you know, I compare that level of pain, which given the recent years of cuts is pretty significant. And I'm sure that this is a similar story to other service departments. I don't mean to say that the schools are the only one experiencing pain. And I just, I just tr I try and look at the balance, right? And that like, could we reduce the road repair resurfacing a little bit? Um, and, and then some of the other items, and I'll, I'll just pick one little one, you know, not to go through the whole list, but the, the replacement of the worn built-in cabinetry and the, um, the police, um, uh, in, in the police building, you know, I, I thought that was a very reasonable request, very thoughtfully presented. Uh, it certainly looks like something that needs to be done. Uh, a relatively small amount of money, twenty-five thousand, and yet a safe and functional room. Um, and I could think off the top of my head when I saw those pictures, you know, at least a half a dozen other rooms in the schools that are at or worse condition. I'm sure Sean could could uh, identify half a dozen of those as well, um, particularly Fort, Fort River and Wildwood. Um, you know, so overall, I just, I just feel like even at this, you know, less than 10, 10 and a half percent budget level that, that is the town's target, there, there isn't a lot of strain here. Um, and I, I, I guess the other big item that I find a particular concern is the North Amherst intersection and streetscape, which admittedly, I don't know a lot of the history of. Um, but um, that's, that's a pretty large amount of borrowing, more than, more than, um, I, I'm, I don't know. I, actually, I'm, I don't know if it's borrowing. It's two, two and a quarter million for this year and next year. It is. Yeah, I don't have the spreadsheet in front of me. Um, but when we're trying to balance, you know, I'll wrap it up here. But I guess when we're trying to balance this year's capital and the four projects that I know everybody cares about um, and not squeezing the operations budget too tightly, that seems like kind of a sore thumb thing that sticks out as like, well, there's there's some pain that we can maybe experience that, that could offset some of the other places. Um, so those are my initial general thoughts. Thanks. Other, other people. Yeah, Sean. Yeah, just to, to respond to that a little bit. You know, I, I think some of that is because we do have, we are planning for four building projects that, in some ways, have alleviated some of the the projects on the plan. As you know, we heard Doug say some of the things have been pushed. They're not going to invest in something that isn't going to be there hopefully in four or five years. Um, and so, so I think some of that's because we're on track for some of these projects and, and we do need to maintain our capital spending in order to do those projects. So it's, it's just to keep that in mind that we do, we have these projects coming that are one of the reasons why our capital budget, our five-year capital plan is in um, maybe feeling a little better because we're not investing heavily in those buildings. Um, and then what was the other piece? Um, I think that's all I'll say for now. Mandy. Thank you. Um, it's not often I agree. I'm going to start with the agreement with Peter one because it's not often Peter and I actually agree on stuff. Um, but I, I want to say I agree with him on the North and Amherst intersection funding um, that we should probably either remove it or push it back a couple of years um, with a note in the report that we should despite that be asking for and applying for grants for it. Um, on the capital side, just in general, um, I will say if we reduce capital spending and move it to operating, that makes next year's FY23's operating budget even leaner and more hard because we have to increase the capital even more than what is planned for the increase between FY22 and FY23 right now, because at some point we have to get up to 10% and we have to do it quickly if we want to have a chance to do the four projects. And that's whether or not the library is voted on MBLC because we have heard plenty that even if the MBLC project is not funded at the library that there is still $15 million or more in work that needs done in that library and needs done quickly. Um, and so yes, the operating budgets might be having some pain but the capital budget 50% drop in spending this year with no capital spending. Um, and with that, we might not be seeing the pain because of how the capital was presented this year. It was presented not as, it was presented as an attempt at a balanced capital spending plan, not 
what we've seen in past years of millions of dollars off because every project is on the list and then we're figuring out how to do it. So that might be why we're not quote seeing the pain as much as we used to see the pain in the capital side. I do wanna ask about school spending um, because I was looking at the capital plan and the unspent money from FY 16, 17 and 18 really jumped out at me for the schools because they have 146,000 unspent from just those three fiscal years. And we don't know what FY19 and 20 and 21 is unspent for building improvements. 146,000 unspent right now from those three fiscal years for building improvements, 33 and a half thousand for tech hardware. And yet this year, the schools are asking for an additional 194,000 for tech hardware and 150,000 for interior upgrades and ADA improvements. And so the question I have is how much do we continue funding at quote typical levels when those levels aren't being spent within, I mean, FY16, we're in FY21 right now. That's five years, if not six. Um, and so it's not that I'm advocating for a cut in building improvements and all for FY22 per se, but I wonder what my question is, how long do we let that sit out there without reducing the ask every year from that? Because their ask this year in some of these categories is nearly identical to what hasn't been spent in those categories for three fiscal years that are four, three, four and five years away, not the most recent three, which could have even more unspent. And I just, um, just, Add one thing to what Mandy is both asking, but I also wonder of the money that hasn't been spent, and Sonia will know this, are they in categories that could be repurposed um, or Sean would, you know, that at one point we were able to buy a bus because something hadn't been spent in another, we didn't have to find the money, we just had to approve uh, repurposing. So if there is a backlog and it crosses over to some of the things that have been asked for this year. Could any of that be spent first on some level? Yeah, so I mean, all the, all the articles, theoretically, the cash articles can be repurposed if the departments tell us they don't need it anymore, um, if they say that those projects are done. Um, I think, you know, on the school side, on some of those older facility articles, um, I'll just say one reason why some of those are still out there is because we there was a lot of turnover facility directors for a few few years in a row, um, or they had three different facility directors in three years. Um, so you know I do think now that they've got a little bit more stability there that that they've made some progress on that front. Um, but that's just part of it. I know that there's other other parts to that. Um, and then maybe Sonia wants to say something about closing out old articles and and. Um, she, you know, she pushes hard on department heads every year to spend these down, um, as you've heard at council, but it probably will be good to hear it again um, from Sonia what the process is that we go through every year to get the departments to spend these um, articles down. Well, I can talk for the town side. And on the town side, we send out um, reports that all department heads have to fill out um, of the expected data when they're gonna use their capital or, or finish their projects. So we've done that and they've done a really good job of cleaning up a lot of the older articles. And when that money's closed out, it's closed out to a control account, which is on the um, report that I, the report that shows the capital, it, it's just a 5,000 number and there's a balance there. And all of that, I track all the articles that are closed because I have to for the DOR, but all of that funding can be used to repurpose for capital. So it doesn't go to free cash, it stays in the capital. And if something comes up as an emergency, that can be appropriated. It can only be repurposed with an appropriation. And so that's one of the, I'm sure everybody remembers, but the, um, the zoning bylaw update, half of 40,000 of that was a repurposed old article. Right. And that was mainly just to make the art the project up to date again because they had encumbered that they had um, asked for that money but they didn't get to the project in time so it, it was in an older article so instead of asking for sixty thousand they asked for a hundred we closed that forty 
to help fund that. So that's something we do all the time. That's. Can I ask an, one other that both Mandy and Peter raised on the North Amherst intersection? And I agree with both of those comments. And number one, my understanding from Paul is the 1.8 million would never be us. That would always be a grant. So that even though it was showing up as if we were spending it, is it, so I just want to verify that we wouldn't, we weren't incurring debt for that was one question. Then the other is if we say push off the request for the 400 plus this year, which would also be debt, is there a small amount of money that's needed to do the kind of convening you're doing with the Pomeroy um, intersection on a, it could look like this, it could look like that, because I know we already have pictures these were done about five years ago, four years ago, of various possible things and to get input on it short of an engineering study. So we are not spending money on the, the more schematic. And I, I don't, I'm not quite sure how we managed to get the Pomeroy money, um, but it looked like we got enough money to do the specs and do the repairs rather than have to first spend $400,000. So I, I just wanted to understand um, what's needed, because I think there's a lot of interest in fixing the intersection, but not a lot of interest in spending $2.2 million of town money um, is the way I would fr frame it. <laughs> yeah. So well, so yeah, so the town had gone for the North Amherst intersection, I think twice, maybe three times for the exact same grant. It was never funded. This year, we tried a different strategy. We went for the Pomeroy Village and it was funded. So apparently the state felt like this, the Pomeroy Village was more a more compelling application. So we usually go, you know, attempt to get the, the funding for major capital projects like this, if it's available. Um, the work on the outreach has been done uh, for North Amherst. Um, you know, as you mentioned about four or five years ago, I think until we know that we're moving forward, it wouldn't make any sense to take take on that task. That's that's work that's usually done either by a consultant or by a town staff, like for Pomeroy, it's the town staff doing the outreach and the, the convening. Um, so unless we're confident that we are going to have funding, um, you know, sometimes what happens is that if we can get a design that's farther far enough along in the state says we have we're, we have money for shovel ready projects that's when we move forward and that's why we like to be in position to move forward uh, on several projects and that's one of the things we are con con you know arguing with this or suggesting to the state is that we have several projects in hand that we can move forward on if they have money coming from the federal government they have to spend we're ready to, to accept it but Paul you didn't have to spend the that first four hundred thousand dollars on Pomeroy is that correct? I mean, we were able to. We, there's some amount in it that the town is putting in it, but I, I just my understanding when I looked at the budget of it, we were able to get it more fully funded. Um, right. So, so it's a it's a simpler intersection because it's, it's we're not reconfiguring, realigning roads or anything like that. Right. Um, and so, yeah, that, that that engineering work is our in kind work from our on in-house engineering staff. Andy. Yeah, I think it's so important to note that we've already made a substantial investment by purchasing the uh, gas station that's no longer in business. And while we use part of it for parking for the North Amherst Library, the intent was to uh, make that the major roadway and to reconfigure so that the uh, most likely be uh, grass between the North Amherst School and the library and really change the character of the neighborhood. So it was a, it's a fairly substantial project, but not one that hasn't been worked on for a while and hasn't had substantial town investment to get us to the point we're at now. No, I, I totally agree. You know, I've got all the documents. It's more the you know, are we ready to spend a large amount of money because we know what we want to do? You know, and it's just, we, we don't need to take everyone's time. I mean, there, there wasn't necessarily full agreement between DPW and what um, the public groups had come up with as the way they wanted it. 
Um, so we certainly don't want to apply for money to do the intersection in a way that's a surprise. Um, there's a lot of support for fixing the intersection, that's for sure. Yeah. Any, any other items um, on both the either request for more information or questions on a um, should this be rec recommended or not? You know, want to be taking it off the recommended list or reducing it in size? Mandy. So sorry about this, but I actually have one for not reducing. Um, and this might depend on um, what Jeremiah comes in with, but I'm concerned that the sustainability improvements line might be too low given some of the answers we got regarding vehicle hybrid options or potential options that haven't been investigated or um, the boiler systems at uh, South Amherst and Munson and all to make up for some of those differences. And, you know, I, of course that means we have to find money somewhere else, but I just have that concern that it might, if, if those haven't been investigated and therefore haven't already been built into those lines like they have been for the police vehicles, um, is my understanding, but if there's other vehicles that it hasn't been built into, that money in the sustainability may not be enough and then we might not be able to do the more sustainable option because we didn't have the information and didn't budget well enough for it over the next year. So would that be a recommendation? It's 50,000 line item now. So it would be a recommendation to increase it. I, I, I kind of lean towards that. I don't know what to increase it to. Like I said, some of it depends on what Jeremiah's answers may be when we hear from him about some of the questions we had on sustainability matters. Um, but it's just a concern I have of it not, it won't cover what we need, we might need it to. Peter. I would happily support the any increase of a reasonable level that Mandy's talking about. See, we don't always disagree, Mandy. Um, as, as long as we take it out of the road repair and resurfacing fund. I mean, I just think that like, we have to like make transparent choices that hurt. And like, you know, we have to take something that we've like, for example, like the North Amherst intersection streetscape that I'm, you know, giving a hard time. I, I think it's a perfectly reasonable project that would benefit the town, you know, but it's, I, I feel like part of the theme that I would like to come across in our recommendations and report to some degree, to whatever degree we have consensus, right, um, is we can't have everything. And, and according to the current, which may change, the current uh, first kind of pass idea, the four projects, is that next year's ops budget will be bad, will be very painful for our operations. And so how do we you know, move these things around in, in, a, in a slightly more spread the pain around manner. So yeah, I mean, we have very aggressive sustainability goals that, uh, you know, are going to be hard to attain and we need to start investing in that at some point. Um, so, you know, what, what are the trade-offs? Um, so I, I mean, I would be open to that kind of discussion. Alex. I just have a question about, I know that, um, with the road resurfacing and sidewalks that a lot of the push was to sort of get out from behind and get out from under. You know, I think there's sort of this diminishing returns. <clears throat> if you get too far behind, right, then that you can't sort of climb your way out. And so um, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with Peter. I guess my question more to DPW or the town is, like, do we still need to be doing the level? I mean, I know we're not even remotely on top of our road resurfacing, but like, what is what is the pain threshold to make sure we don't get into a hole that we can't climb out of ever? So the, oh, can I answer that, Kathy? Yep. So the goal was before these four projects come online was to put a lot of, as much money into roads as possible because they hadn't been funded at a high level before. And so before these, um, you know, before some, a lot of the capital goes towards these new buildings, we were trying to um, fund at a much higher level the roads. And so there still is a backlog. Um, so, you know, that's why we kept the number for FY22 at, at a higher number. And if you look at the plan, you know, you'll see that number start to go down and out years as the building debt comes on. And I just, uh, I, I got, um... 
a good friend of ours who lives in South Amherst made a comment that she thinks the roads are in better shape than she can ever remember them, um, which is an interesting comment. I, you know, it's not a neighbor I know who's talking about his potholes, but she was wondering of the fact that we were closed a way down for car traffic during COVID for 12 months, that we didn't get the type of wear and tear on our roads that we would normally have had for a 12 month period. Do we have any evidence of that other than, you know, the particular roads she happened to drive on were in good shape? You know, so I, you know, this is one person's impression that usually by March of a year, it's when we start seeing the ravages of winter on our roads. Um, Holly would say that our um, our insurance claims are down for potholes and things of that nature. So, so that's a, a small piece of anecdotal evidence that maybe the Fewer people are on the roads and, and maybe there's fewer potholes. Paul, Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah. yeah, so I don't have the report in front of me, but a few years ago, the town did do an assessment of its roads. And I think it came out to be that there was about two million, about $10 million worth of road work that needed to be done. They projected about $2 million needed per year. And that's what we've been trying to attack. The last four years, we have increased our contribution into road improvements. I think you're seeing the result of that. I think you're, that's an accurate anecdotal statement. Uh, there is there's still a lot of side roads that haven't been addressed. We've mainly focused our efforts on the on the um, major roads that, that you'll see on northeast, southeast, I think, things like that. Um, I think you know the I think some road traffic makes a difference, but what really makes the biggest difference is weather. So when there's freezing and thawing, that's what breaks up the roads the quickest. Um, and so we haven't had that much of that this year, and that's actually been a blessing. We, we could still have more of that because this is the rainy, this is the season where it starts to happen in March. All right, Jer Jeremiah's not in the room yet. I can't see everybody. He is, he is. Oh, oh he is, perfect. Um, Kathy, do you wanna to go to Jeremiah for the sure. facility pieces? Sure. You have to admit him. Oh, I have, to, I have to admit him? Oh, he's in the, hold on, let me stop sharing for a second. There he is, all right. Hey, Jeremiah, can you um, hear us? I can. So um, you were gonna provide a little bit more information on the, um, the potential to upgrade the chiller at the police station and the HVAC system at Munson um, to a, you know, the highest efficiency system that we could do there. Yeah, certainly. So it's, it's, I would say for, for the police department, it's been a little bit more of a challenge. Um, I've attempted to reach out to train as they're one of, uh, uh, just a huge dealer of both chillers and also VRF systems and had some, some challenges, but working through a local HVAC vendor that the town uses quite a bit and in neighboring uh, municipalities use, uh, had a, a good discussion about each of the different projects and tried to come up with some better numbers. Uh, more accurate numbers would really have to, have to uh, be done by uh, an engineer. Uh, Really, you would need someone to go in and, and do an evaluation of each of the spaces and the thermal load of the building um, for the police department, you know, it's a 24 hour facility, and then figuring out what a option you're going with. Um, but so thinking about the police department, we do have a hydronic system there, as, as I said in the, the last meetings. Um, so I, I wanted to approach it with in two different ways, looking at it as a full VRF change out, or what can we do with our current system? So maintaining as much of the current system as possible, but still um, shooting for our, our sustainability goals and ultimately replacing equipment that is, is going to fail us. Um, if we were to go with a full VRF system, that would obviously be the most expensive. Uh, the vendor estimated probably around eight to 900,000 if we were to do full VRF. Uh, and, and also it would probably have the largest impact on the operations of the facility. Uh, just due, due to the amount of work that it would take. 
So you would have all these condensers outside and then you would have all these cassettes indoors. Well, you would need to get into every one of those spaces. You would either be on the wall or above the ceiling. All that refrigeration line would have to be run, branch boxes. So, so the impact to the operations would be tremendous. It, re it really would be difficult while they were doing that work. Uh, but could it be done? Certainly. Okay. And, and also a full VRS system would probably give us the best amount of control and the best control overall for the space condition. But as, as I said, it comes with the greatest cost. So the other thing I wanted to look at is just replacing a chiller. What if we just replace the chiller? So what are our options? Our options are to replace the chiller with an electric chiller uh, that has a heat pump. So essentially it's gonna operate very much like a VRF system. A, a chiller with a heat pump will condition and, and give you cold air for, through the, the summer season. But then in the heating season, it's going to heat that water. So it does both. And actually the, the chiller that I was looking at can do it simultaneously. So if we did have the hydronic loop that would support it, I could both heat the building and cool the building at the same time. And I really feel that this is probably the easiest and the best route to go. Um, so. Uh, train has, has a chiller. It's a modular chiller. It's called a polytherm. And that's, that was the one that really caught my eye. Uh, most VRF systems, if people understand some of the um, energy efficient ratings, could be anywhere between 11 and 16 SEER. Now, this, this piece of equipment is at 20, operates at 28 SEER. So it is well beyond the energy efficiency of most VRS systems. But I, I do wanna say that that's always theoretical. When you're in the field and it's practical, it changes. But let's, let's start with those very high numbers and then we work, work our way backwards. So I think it has a lot of positives. So this system could, could essentially, you remove that chiller and put this new chiller in place. The existing plumbing is six inch, that, that has a six inch hookup. So, so fashioning this piece of equipment, this new piece of equipment into our existing building would be much, much easier. And we would be able to uh, essentially eliminate our, our reliance on fossil fuels. Although again, I will say, I, as I did last time, I would love to, we have brand new boils, boilers, let's just keep them. If we had a full week of negative 20 degrees, we want some redundancy. Uh, but it would be very, very seldom used. Um, so, so really, I would like to pursue this, this avenue, this alternative to a full VRS system. Uh, and and the, the HVAC contractor, his numbers that he was saying, probably about four to 500,000. So we were, we were in the same ballpark. Um, but, but I think that this is probably... Uh, what a, a good direction to look. Any, any questions on that or you want me to continue with Munson? Um, I Jeremiah, can I, or Kathy, can I ask Jeremiah one follow-up question? From a, a maintenance perspective, Jeremiah, are, do these systems last, you know, 30 years or 25 years? Um, and are they similar in terms of ongoing maintenance that you, uh, needs to be done? And, and do, do we have the expertise to maintain them? Yes and no. So some of that, that equipment is very specialized, uh, but, but is it something that's beyond what uh, uh, an HVAC company that typically deals with that type of equipment? It wouldn't, it wouldn't require like a specialist from train or carrier. Uh, you could have that equipment maintained by a, a local vendor who is experienced with chillers. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what would me or, or other uh, town staff do as operators? There wouldn't be a lot for us to do. It would be more visual inspections. It would be 
it would be maintaining the water loop more than anything. Because if we maintain that water loop, that's gonna help maintain the equipment. I would say a new piece of equipment like that should be maintained by the manufacturers or, or someone that the manufacturer recommends. Uh, the, it's, it, is a different, it is a different type system. Our current chillers, uh, uh, essentially tube and shell, and this one has plate chillers in it. So it's a whole different animal. So Alex, you have a question or comment? Yeah, I guess I'm, you had talked about the efficiency of the systems and there's sort of this odd conversation where we're a group who talks about capital and there's a different group who talks about operating, but the reality is the efficiencies of the system are gonna impact the operating budgets. So it feels, it feels awkward for us to be talking about sustainability and efficiencies in a vacuum that don't relate to the operating budgets for the police department. Um, is there a significant difference in terms of efficiency um, between the VRF system and the replacing that you're talking about from an operational perspective? If they're roughly the same equivalency and efficiency, then my guess is no, but um, just curious. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect there be a, a lot of difference in the operational budget. The one thing that we would have to consider when we, when we consider operational expenses and what we may see for, for the police department would be a lot of the, you know, I, I talked about maintaining this hydro, hydronic loop. Well, all of the other accessories in there are fan coil units. Uh, the, those fan coil units are, are really just a, a fan motor in a box. Uh, could we experience, those motors are degrading. Will we have to replace some of those motors? Yes, absolutely. Um, and what would we get if we had a full VRS system? Well, we would have brand new equipment that, that shouldn't need any, any repairs for some time. It would just be basic cleaning filter changes. Um, so I, I would anticipate there being some ongoing uh, operational expenses, but those are ones that we have now. You know, if I need to replace a fan coil motor, you know, it's the ninety-seven dollars to buy a new motor and have it have it put in, and then essentially the box is great. You know, I I change a filter, um, uh, but but looking at it from like a utility uh, expense, it, it I would have to I would have to look at the chiller more so to see what it would require. A full VRS system does have a huge electrical load and it would be nice to have that offset with solar. And I know that is something that we are looking at for, for the police department. Either instance, so if we were going with the chiller or the VRS system, I would say it would be wonderful to have it offset with, with solar. And I think that that's something that, that I, I, I think us as a town, we really absolutely have to look at because that's the next step. You know, if we if we're adding all this electrical, let's offset it with renewables. Um, but I, I I couldn't give you a, a good solid figure on what would be more or less um, efficient as far as utilities. What what's going to drive up operational costs more? So I, I think that is police department. So maybe go to Munson at this point. Sure. And so Munson, I, I submitted a, a bunch of documents and, and plans and uh, o over to the HVAC company. And uh, again, we had a good dis long discussion about Munson. Um, and so in, in doing so, he I, I had a few options, these are ideas really, but I had a few ideas for him and said, what if we did this? What if we went full VRS, VRF nets a, a ductless system? Or what if we tried to reduce some of the expenses and, and maintain our existing duct work and just went with a VRF system, but it works through an air handler? Could we do that? So trying to be fiscally responsible, but also achieve the goals that we're, we're looking for. And ultimately, I would say for the hall section, so we have one furnace that, that satisfies the heating and ventilation for the main hall and the basement area. The air handler, so looking at a VRS system with an air handler for the indoor, 
unit, it wouldn't be able to satisfy that space. We would have to do it at like a traditional ductless system that you would know. So you would see in that hall some, some type of equipment, whether it be sort of a wall mount down below, uh, like a cabinet, or it be up towards the ceiling as some type of cassette. But that would be what, would, what we'd have to do to satisfy the heating and cooling of that space. Uh, the library, we may have a few other options, but ultimately uh, through our discussion, we felt that full VRF would be the best way to go as Munson really isn't all that big. We just have to deal with a very large space for the hall. Um, he, he said that he anticipates the cost being around between 110 and 120,000 for that building. So in, in the capital, I said probably around 150 in hopes uh, that maybe I can bundle some other energy conservation measures for the building. So one of the big areas that we need beyond uh, just changing out this heating and cooling is provide some additional insulation for that hall. If we were to go up on top of that hall, there's only a few inches of blown in insulation that cover the archway to that main hall. So I, I really need to get some better insulation on that and that will, that will help uh, bring down the, uh, the heating and cooling load for that space. Um, so trying to look at this as an energy uh, conservation project. So HVAC replacement, but also looking at at doing something with that, that archway and insulating. And if there's, a, if there's additional money, then ceiling fans would, very, would help very much in that space too. Mandy. So um, you just said you'd like 150,000 and I, uh, this might be for Sean. I'm looking at the FY22. It looks like we had 30,000 um, put in for HVAC at Munson. Am I missing something or is the new? Yeah. So there's a, there's a 90,000, I believe there's a $90,000 article that already exists. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So that 30,000 will bring up to 120. So if we want to go to the 150, we would add 30 more. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That I, I don't know, Sean. Is there was there some other amounts that was somewhere? Yeah, I mean, it talks about potentially, um, you know, some of those those building improvement, like the big yeah. building improvement budget, potentially could cover some of that, or the sustainability budget, especially if we increase it, could be put towards some of that, um, or we could just increase that by thirty thousand, and you know, so it's dedicated line item there. So, so building on Mandy's question then, Sean, um, you know, other than the specific number, will this lead to a revision of what you have in the list for FY22? Or is that extra 30 somewhere that that's fungible in some way? So, so my hope is that you guys will make a recommendation on what you think we should do. And then the town manager will update that for what, you know, take that feedback from your recommendation and update the plan before it goes to the council. Um, so if you think that, um, you know, my guess is the town manager probably already has some thoughts on potentially increasing that to, to go with the more sustainable option. But I think it would be even better if you recommended that. And then that way, um, you know, we can factor that in before we make the final version. And I think some things, you know, it's good if you identify where the offsetting um, money will come from. So if we're going to spend 30 more, then what are we spending 30 less on? You don't have to, um, you know, if you just think we should, um, you know, that's also fine. But, you know, it'd also be good to hear thoughts on, um, you know, we've got a couple areas that departments identified where maybe we could spend less. So we've got a couple target areas, whether it be computers or, or copiers. Um, but also, and, and I know at least one committee member said roads, Peter, somewhere down there. Um, so, so we've got a couple areas um, to look at um, for the final version. 
Yeah, and I and I just, I guess I would just also like to say is if if well, at the end of the day and I and I needed to be less for the library section, could I go with the air handler for the indoor unit? Uh, th that would be that would be significantly less money than putting a uh, an air handler unit in each space. So rather than be putting in seven units, I'm putting in one that can handle that space. Is but we are relying on the older ductwork, and the the newest that ductwork was was uh, reworked was in 1988. So it's uninsulated. Uh, it there it's not sealed. It's not in. And so you are going to have some infiltration. You're going to have leakage. Um, ultimately, I would love to just go full ductless there and and be done. Because there's always these projects where you go, am I doing enough? We we have this target, this sustainability goal, and and I and I you know, am I doing enough? Is, is it enough to just get rid of the fossil fuels and put these systems in? Ultimately, it may not be, and that's why I want to bundle in, do the best I can, bundle in the insulation, and try to try to really do the most I can for each facility. Um, I, Alex and Andy's hand are both up. I didn't see which order. So Andy, why don't you go for, and then Alex? I just had a question, which is uh, whether there's any data available as to which sections of the Munson building and which other build and for buildings in general, how many of them are used, how many hours per week? I mean, we know, for example, that the police station is a 24 seven building and most of our other buildings are not. Um, the branch libraries are um, not open seven days a week. Um, they're on more limited hours. So is there that kind of uh, information available and does that help us think through this conversation? I, I do believe that there is some, some of that information. Uh, there, I, I believe someone, I don't know if it's Angela or Jennifer that, that records some of that information or has for, for the months in. Um, so I, yeah, I agree that is important information. Uh, I'd also like to know, uh, just ha have it as a note that if we did full VRF system, um, that, that we would be able to uh, essentially section off some areas. So you could go easily go down to an unoccupied mode so that you're heating and cooling less in that space. If we were to maintain the ductwork that's in there and just use an air handler unit, I'm gonna be heating or cooling all of those spaces the same. So if the hall's not being used or the stage area or the basement's not being used, uh, then there's great opportunities to save money by controlling that uh, heating and cooling system. So Alex and then Carrie. I, I guess I want to make sure I was understanding what Sean was asking of us. So I think what I understand of the budget is for the months in, there's already 90,000 set aside. What's in this budget is 30,000, which gets us to 120. And a full VRF system, you're estimating between 110, 120,000. And then for the police station, you weren't recommending the full VRF for the 800 to 900, you are recommending the replacement between 400 and 500, and the ask is 400. So I personally, Having, having been mired in, you know, HVAC in the library and the level of detail, like do not want to be telling police in town what to do with their building. So I, I mean, I guess, I don't know if Sean's looking for us to say like, go as sustainable as makes sense and we approve the budget, which I think is the recommendation that you're making that one, we go full VRF and one, we don't like, I, like to me, like I like I just have this whole disconnect between like capital and operating or like it's all linked, you know what I mean? And I just don't want to be in this bubble of like full VRF, go forward, spend all the money. That doesn't make any sense to me. So I, I guess I want to better understand what you're looking for from us in terms of recommendations around these systems. Is this a question to me, Alex? I don't know who it's to. <laughs> like, um, what, what are you guys looking for? <laughs> So, so that this is one of the reasons why I kind of thought there'd be two buckets to the recommendation discussion. So, you know, if you feel really strongly or if the committee feels really strongly, yes, we should go to that higher level. 
then I think you would recommend that we change it to that higher level. If it's sort of like what you just said, Alex, or maybe it's, um, it's hard to make that decision right now. Um, again, maybe you recommend it as it is, but say, you know, you should seek more input on this area and, cons and consider increasing it um, up to that higher level. If, you know, if, you know, you know, like the, um, the ECAC is coming out with their plan soon, like maybe if we get that in time, that will dictate where we go with this. Um, so, so that's why there's sort of two buckets or two tiers of recommendations, things that um, like we, you want us to change and things that you want us to consider potentially changing with more information, which I know that's not really helpful, but um, <laughs> just- Carrie, my... it, Carrie, Carrie well, it's, you get to jump in to, oops, you're muted. All right, two questions. Um, so the first is kind of, we're talking HVAC systems and the school committee, we've been talking about HVAC systems with regards to COVID and potentially, you know, having more air exchanges being optimal for, for dealing with that. I know we'll hopefully won't be, won't be in the same world, but I don't think we're ever going to stop caring about air exchanges. Um, so I was wondering if there's any advantage or disadvantage to moving to this VRS system compared to what was proposed earlier um, from that framework, like thinking about um, airflow in the building. Um, the, the second thing I think is a much bigger question. So generally I'm, I'm in favor of the idea of moving towards a more sustainable um, greener option here. I, this is kind of a big town question. I mean, you know, adding 30,000 here, are we, you know, is it gonna give us the most bang for our buck in terms of being green greener? So like, is there a 30,000 we could spend elsewhere to, you know, save carbon emissions someplace else. And the problem is that I, I think what we're alluding to here with like the lack of communication between operations and it's too like, we're, we have this sustainability pot of money and I think it makes sense to spend it because we, we it's, a, it's our values of, as a town that we want to reduce our carbon emissions. But I'm just wondering, is there like a way we could say, we're all for spending $30,000 if it's gonna um, improve our efficiency for town this much. But if there's another place we could put that $30,000 where it would actually reduce our carbon emissions even more, then I'd be happy to, to redirect the money there. I, I apologize because I'm not on town council. I'm looking to those of you who actually look over more <laughs> agencies than just like, you know, I'm pretty narrowly focused on the schools. But I remember that's something I came back to a lot when we were talking about you know, spending the money on a really big bus is that there were more efficient ways of spending the money to get a, you know, um, having a bigger impact in terms of our carbon footprint. Uh, Sean. Sorry, quick follow up to that. Um, so both of these projects are on the list because the HVAC systems are sort of failing and need to be replaced. Um, so, so we have to do something to these HVAC systems. And the question is, you know, if the, this is a 20 year or 30 year investment, um, you know, we're, it's not like a vehicle where, you know, we may have another shot at going for electric or hybrid in, you know, in five to 10 years with something like this, we're stuck with it for 20 to 30 years. Um, so I think, you know, hearing more from Jeremiah about, you know, these systems that will get us, you know, will potentially be net zero ready. Um, you know, I think it makes sense to at least explore those, you know, allocating the funds now for those projects. Yeah, and to answer your questions. So the first question about ventilation system, if we were to maintain the equipment that's in the Amherst Police Department and just changing out the chiller, uh, we, we would really be making no impact to the ventilation side of the system. There's still, there still would be air handlers that are pulling fresh air from the outside and, and mixing that um, and that, so you would be still pulling in some of that, that, uh, that good air from the outdoors and as well as uh, dealing with, you know, that stale air. So you'd be discharging some of that. Um, if we were to do a full VRF system over at Munson, additional ventilation would be necessary. Uh, that's something that I'm looking at with Sean right now, and, ho and hopefully we can, uh, we can get it through CARES. So if the uh, VRF system for Munson is about 110 to 
My estimation for uh, energy recovery ventilation system and ERV is probably be, uh, tw between about twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars per building that I'm that I'm looking at. So that would kind of put me at that one hundred and fifty. If I could get the e the ERVs paid for by CARES, which would be a bonus, then I want the insulation because you, you know we need all of these measures ultimately to to reduce our uh, our fuel usage or our energy consumption. Um, so yes, at Munson, we would need to do something at the police department, we'd be okay. Uh, and to speak on that second point, and this is probably something I should have noted last time I met with you, uh, you all, the Munson, the Munson library needs a, few, uh, a refill, a full tank refill of oil every three weeks. Every three weeks. So if anyone burns number two fuel at home, that's a 275 gallon tank. Three weeks, I'm through that. And that's with the hall virtually empty, not being used. So I'm running that usually in the mid 50s, that space. So I'm not really doing much. If that hall was being utilized by all our groups, I would have to turn that heat up. And right now I'm burning through a tank of oil every three weeks. Besides these being circa 1952, <laughs> they they really got to go so <laughs> it sounds like you need the insulation then as well <laughs> yes <laughs> and windows i i, I have a list <laughs> so it's i there are three hands up peter i think first and then mandy and alex yeah, so I have the same what do you want from me uh, take as Alex. Um, so plus one on that. Uh, but if you're looking for a recommendation, Sean, I'd say, you know, without getting into the, the whole rigmarole, a higher level on the Munson, the lower level on the police and try and offset it from something else that's already been proposed. Okay, next. Um, I'm not sure which one hand went up first, Mandy. Mandy. Yeah, I don't have an order here. I'm just looking at the screen. Mandy? Alex. Alex went up, okay. So I guess all of these conversations are making me think along the lines of the conversations that we had around vehicles, right? Like having a plan around vehicles. And I know that we're putting together a capital inventory plan, but I mean, so I'm thinking about like, as we start thinking about sustainability and climate resilience and things like that, like we need to have a climate resilience hub in town. I don't know what that building is, but like if we determine that a building is, if the police station is our climate resilience hub, then I want the air exchanges really well, good. Like there are certain things that I think I would want out of a building that's designated as like that hub that I might not care as much about other buildings. And so again, for me coming back to like making decisions in a vacuum and not knowing, and then also, you know, I know like if you go to the Energy Star website, they rank municipal buildings in terms of like which building is probably your biggest polluter, right? And I mean, typically it's libraries, which is why like I'm a really big fan of like fixing the library, but I don't actually know for our town if that's true because all of our buildings need to have their HVAC systems replaced. And so, I mean, so I think the more we do to move towards sustainability, the better but the more information we have to be making decisions with a limited budget in the right places, like targeting, you know, the VRF systems, like if we only have this pot, limited pot of money, right, let's target it in buildings that are going to be our climate resiliency hubs or that where we're going to get the most bang for our buck in terms of energy efficiency for the town. So I guess for me, and that's not going to happen this year, I guess if this if this conversation is going to continue as we as we move forward, that's the kind of information that would be helpful, I think. Uh, Tammy, uh, so Mandy, then Tammy. Thank you. Um, if you're looking for a recommendation from me, uh, I have one question for Jeremiah, but it would be definitely do the VRF, you know, in the Munson. We need to replace it anyway, and so let's go with the one that seems the way to go for all sorts of reasons. Um, you know, I, I'm certainly not against questioning or going to question uh, Jeremiah's belief on the chillers with the heat pump at the police station either because I'm not an expert. So let's go that way. Um, it sounds like Jeremiah would like more 
of more money, 30,000 in addition to what's in this plan for insulation and potentially ceiling fans and all of that. And so I guess one, the question I have for Jeremiah is, does that need to be done simultaneously? Is there an efficiency for doing that simultaneously? Or is that something we could put into a recommendation for, hey, if we can find the 30,000 for FY22, let's get it. And if we can't, let's move it to FY23 or four, because it sounds like given a tank every three weeks that it desperately needs insulation. Um, and, and all I've known myself about these things are the better insulated it is, the better these type of systems, heat pump systems work. Um, so we wouldn't want to ignore the insulation, but um, if, it, if there's no efficiencies in doing it at the same time, because you're already in say the duct, you know, in the ceilings or something, then maybe it's something we could say, if we can't find the money for FY22, let's see if we can find it for FY23 or four. Yeah, I, I agree. I would have to say that the insulation is not an absolute need while the heating system is being replaced. Um, but perhaps we can consider some of the all building fund because uh, that's both for interior and exterior. So if, if we needed to, maybe we can lean on that pot of money uh, so that we can uh, be about as efficient as we can at, at the, you know, once they, I get to turn the key on and, you know, we're, we're, we're using that, that new system. Tammy. Yeah, I just like to echo um, my support for Munson in particular, seeing as I live around the corner and I take Ellis SSE classes there. I've gone to district meetings in the basement, I mean, prior to COVID. And I obviously go to the library a lot. And I know the heating and the cooling is really uneven right now. And um, I agree that it seems really foolish to be heating the hall when nobody's in it. And sometimes when we take classes, there's too much heat and we have to open the windows, that's for yoga. And so it, it's just been really uneven and uncomfortable. And I'm thrilled at the idea of having an updated energy efficient system. And so you can close off some of the areas and not have to pay for oil every three weeks. That's really horrible. Thank you. So um, at least I'm hearing consensus on this, Sean, so. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is I, I think, I think we've got enough to go with on this um, to put into a draft um, report, and then we can get people's feedback next time. So, any other? So, sorry, Kathy. One thing I'd ask is if there's any other questions on facility, other facility items while Jeremiah's here. Okay. Thank you're you. Off, you're off the hook, Jeremiah. Thank you. So we're still on the, we're still on FY22. And I guess, are there any other um, issues that need a discussion before we talk about recommendation on FY22. Mandy. I mean, we have to find, we potentially should recommend somewhere to get rid of somewhere between 15 and 60,000 or so. Um, and that's, you know, simply because it's not in balance right now. And I'm sure the manager would like to hear where that recommendation might be to get it to balance. Um, I'm not sure I know I have I don't think I have a strong preference at this point to say myself where I would do it, but I think we need to talk about that. Well, in my, me my memory on the school copiers was there was potentially, and Sean, I just have to go back and look at notes. There was potentially 35 or 50,000 in that. And what I don't remember is whether it was the big copy or rather than the small, because there's a differential price on them. Um, so that's the only thing where 
literally it was offered to us that we don't necessarily need all of that right now this year um it wasn't peter saying can't you bear some pain here <laughs> so um but i'm if anyone else has any memories of areas, because a lot of these are smaller, you know, we there were a couple places where the price tag for a truck was not the same and one was higher versus lower. So if we could get both at the lower price, that would be great. Um, you know, and I think Dave Zomek said, oh, it's only a $5,000 difference, but 5,000 helps when you're talking about 15. Uh, so that's some of just fine tuning numbers. So both Alex and Peter have their hands up. Um, Alex, then Peter, go. I, I always try and deflect and wind up being first. Um, yeah, I, this is such a small amount this year that I, I mean, if the town manager or finance director are leaning a certain way, I mean, I'm, I'm, I always feel badly about the person who comes before us and is like, I'm willing to cut where the other people aren't willing to cut. You know what I mean? Like that, that to me is not reflective of where cuts can be made. That's reflective of the person presenting. So with such a small amount, if they have an idea, like I'm fine with that. So I would look to ask if there's a place where you're seeing that number. Sean? I mean, I think the one place we would want to look both on the town side and the school side is computers, only because CARES has been able, been able to do so much um, with technology. Uh, and so, you know, I'd want to talk to Jerry and Sean a little bit more before, you know, saying a specific amount. Um, but that's the one area that kind of jumps out to me just because I know we've spent a lot on it with CARES. Oh, Peter. Yeah, so um, the fact that it is a small amount does raise the question, could we could we spread it out so thinly across so many things that it would be virtually painless to any one thing, right? Because they all come in conservatively. They're like, oh, I said 120, but it's really going to be somewhere between 100 and 105, and, which is appropriate. I'm not bashing that. That's, that's what you should do because of cost overruns and whatnot. You don't want to come back for another article. Um, but that that's one way the, the copier, if I recall, was the larger copier at the high school. It was like 49 or something. Um, if, if I recall, and Sean, you can check this with Doug. Um, it was it was something that we could defer, but is but we're going to have to do relatively soon. So it wasn't um, it wasn't another five or 10 years. Right. It was it was the fact that it hadn't really been used uh, to its normal usage um, given COVID. Yeah, so, so I think the copier request was for two smaller copiers at the elementary schools, and then um, one part of the bigger copier at the high school um, that serves both the elementary school and the high school, or the elementary school system and the high school system. Um, Sonia is is texting me some positive news that if you, I don't think we can do this for all of it, but for the smaller gap there of 15,000, we could potentially look at some of the older articles and, and close some of those out, some of the re repurposing, either articles that have already been closed out or do another pass at some of the older ones and see if there's anything we can eke out of there. Andy. So it may be too late to do it for this year, but uh, as I've listened to the process through this year, I get the sense that to a certain extent, and this is just honest, dealing honestly as people do, um, they put in the higher amount for the um, each of the projects that they're working on. And then they assume that they won't have to come back. And if there's some turn back, that's good. It works out for either the department or for the town as a whole. And, um, as a consequence, we may be in the position where on capital, we tend to over budget a little bit um, when you take an across the board approach. And um, from our experience last year, uh, it, it, or for the current year really, <laughs> since we're in still in, um, in that year, uh, it makes me wonder whether we should be um, not doing that and whether we should be uh, instead creating a regular reserve fund as we did this year um, and then directing and suggesting that 
the manager had that fund to use at discretion when um, costs don't come in to the extent that they expected so that we don't pick it what the cuts have to be, but we're giving the discretion to the manager to make that decision as the year proceeds and uh, he and Shauna and Sonia see how the uh, actual costs are coming in against what was uh, projected at this point in time. Can, can I ask, Sandy, you said it, this would be for a future year. Are you thinking a some of this would be called a reserve and then there would be specific requests? Well, we can do it this year too. Okay. Um, but uh, when I was saying future years, I was thinking of being more directive in future, suggesting that we be more directive in future years about um, how uh, numbers are submitted within the capital plan to begin with. And um, that's the part that is probably too late to work on, but uh, we could just uh, do it across the board, cutting a certain, some percentage in virtually everything, unless we have an absolute solid number and uh, roll that money into a reserve and uh, then give that discretion during the year to use it where it's most important and necessary to use it. There's a, and Sonia has her hand up and then I'll, you know, if Sean probably wants to respond to that, but Sonia, I saw your hand go up, so. Hear me? Yes. Okay. First time I've used the headphones, that's why. Um, I just want to remind everybody that when we're voting this capital um, plan, it's it's all one number. So we have, it's really a bottom line dollar amount that we're voting, but some projects come under and some projects come over and it is perfectly within the, um, within the um, mass general laws to allow us to move. If there's excess in one account, we can move it to the other account that there's a little deficit to. So we do have some of that flexibility too. So I just wanted to remind everybody of that. Sean. And my one follow-up was gonna be, you know, if people don't feel strongly about any one project to reduce, um, I don't necessarily think it's a good idea to reduce everything. I think at that point, it would be better just to make your recommendation of what you wanna increase. And I can work with Paul and, and we can work with the departments to see what logically makes sense to um, reduce. Um, I don't think we need to, you know, again, unless there's something that jumps out that the group wants to reduce, I don't think it, it's probably super productive to, you know, think of all these different ways to kind of eke out a small amount of savings. So what, what I've heard in terms of the increases so far is go up on Munson to insulate unless Jeremiah thinks he can find that 30,000. And then Mandy's suggestion on your sustainability 50,000 is too low. Those are the two I've heard. Um, so I don't know whether it's a, and it, whether we had, a, you know, like double the sustainability and that's another 50,000. So I don't know whether that's what you're looking for. Like there are two areas that uh, increases, Mandy. Yeah, so I would say now that I've heard from Jeremiah um, that I'm not as sold on my own suggestion to increase it as much. I was concerned about those HVAC numbers and and what they might be, but but with more information, you know, the borrowing will do when we need to. Um, and it sounds like the Munson could fit within that 50,000 or there might be other ways to get that extra 30, but otherwise it's already there. And so then it's just the the um, vehicles. So it might not be as critical to raise it above the 50. Of course, if there's more too and, and other things come in, then we might decide differently, but I'm not as set on it anymore. So did your hand go back up or did it just not come Oops. down? That's okay. That's okay. Okay, so we're, um, I'm just trying to do a uh, probably should do a time check too, but I, so far what I've heard is there is, um, there were several voices that said um, North Amherst intersection seems like a big piece and to reduce it and or push it out of, it doesn't actually hit this year's spending because it was proposed to be debt, but to push it out. 
And I had asked Sean, we can't right now see exactly what that debt is, or maybe we can, but it, yeah, I, I, tell didn't you if it, I didn't know whether the 1.8 million was also shown on it, but it doesn't hit us till FY23. So that gives us some breathing room in FY23. But that's the only thing I've heard um, that people were calling into question as a line item at all at this point. And we talked around Munson that I think we're back to Jeremiah thinking he may have enough money because he can pull off his general fix it fund for the insulation. So it's, and then the sustainability, how far you can stretch that 50. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If we take off the North Amherst intersection, it saves us about um, 200, 230,000 um, out in FY24. That's when the, the projected debt payments would start. So if we take it off completely, it would, it would, it would give us that much more available. If we push it out, then it would just push that number out into future years. Okay. Carrie. I just want to be a voice to say that I, as <laughs> I, I wasn't at the presentation, so I apologize, but I just, I just find that North Amherst intersection absolutely frustrating as a North <laughs> resident. So I, I think if we take it completely, like I would have a huge problem if we take it just as a resident, I want to be a voice for, you know, something needs to be done there. And I think there's been a lot of planning put into it. And when I was looking at the, the documentation, it was listed as a high priority item. Um, it was the top level. So I, I, I just want to be a voice for, you know, maybe we could make a suggestion to, to think about the size of it, but it, it's a problematic part of town. And, and I think there's a lot of safety concerns there too. And so as a, pedestrian who's tries to jog through there and somebody who tries to drive through there no, so, yeah, no, be a voice for that no i think there is that you know the 1.8 wasn't supposed to be on is is a grant and it just is 450 the right amount for whatever it is we need to do so we can secure a grant would be one question um and there is you know just so people know there is this other uh, and Alex, I see your hand up, but there is this other issue up here. I, I hate the intersection. You know, I, I'm just a mile up the road from it, but um, there's a possible large project coming in that we keep hearing coming soon, but not clear. But if it would do, it would be a big um, new building with offices and with maker space, which would increase the traffic. And we haven't seen what the traffic will look like with the Beacon North Square being fully open yet because it started to be fully occupied, but then everybody left and wasn't driving their car anymore. You know, so there is the potential that as bad as it is, it could get worse. Um, so I think there is interest on it. And it's just more a feeling of, you don't wanna spend a lot of time on engineering something where we haven't already made a decision what we really want. And then, you know, the state funding something so just getting some consensus because there wasn't, there were good diagrams and I'm not sure DPW had the same idea as what people thought they had agreed on. So that was just a background piece on, you know, spending money on something that everybody wants would be great. Um, so Sean, you were, and, and I think Alex's hand was up. To, Alex's hand was up. Okay. Yeah, Alex. Yeah, I think I just want to, echo sort of Carrie's comment. I feel like the North Amherst intersection feels like, like Manny Joe had a comment and Kathy had a comment and I suspect you know more as counselors than, than we do. So I'm hesitant to speak as JCPC on the North Amherst common or the North Amherst intersection because I, the reality is, I mean, I know how it impacts the library. I know I don't like it when I go volunteer at the survival center, but like, I don't feel like as a JCPC member, I have enough information to make any comments relative to the budget. Um, and so I think I sort of echo Carrie's like, I'm happy to put a placeholder on it, but I, like, I, yeah, I don't know enough to be speaking as JCPC on that matter. Okay. So it sounds like we write some sentences to say this, Sean. And yeah, and I, you know, I hesitate to, to open up this box, but, um, you know, the question could be whether the North Amherst Live or North Amherst intersection is on the plan 
or in that section of projects that are on the radar that we're waiting for, a, you know, if, if we truly are just going to keep it there until we get a grant, then do we want it on the plan or not? Because um, again, my goal this year was to try to only put things on the plan that, you know, when we get there, we're going to do them, not to just keep pushing them out every year. So if it's something that we really are just going to wait for a grant and we're not going to put any money into, then we may want to put it down in that other section of the plan and just leave it there so we don't lose sight of it, but just we know it's there. Mandy. Uh, Sean brought us into a question I was actually in a request I was actually going to do because there's a number of Amherst recreation items on this list that are right for CPA funds, but they're on this list, um, particularly for FY23 and FY24, the War Memorial Playground and the Mill River Playground. Um, and so the request I was going to have is can we somehow in these CIPs and these lists um, put a star or mark, somehow mark with some different coloring or a footnote or something, those particular projects that, you know, have potential other sources of funding and that will be going for those other sources of funding. But if they don't get them, we need to consider doing them ourselves after maybe one or two years of asking for that funding, you know, I mean, because if Mill River doesn't get the funding from CPA next year, maybe we would decide not to wait another year to request CPA again. Um, and that goes to your thing of trying to put things in that would be spent when we get there. And, and that's where I see sort of North Amherst. I think we're struggling with the, the amount of the ask when some of it was for construction, not just design development. Um, and there's a goal to get a grant for some of that um and, and it but the grant but but it's still on here even if there is no grant so i think that's that's where i'm going somehow mark the potential ones that have potential for grant cool so um i think that's a really good point mandy joe in terms of the cpa committee um you know town staff have been trying to put more and more of the town projects to CPA. I think CPA, I, I mean, Kathy, you go to their meetings as to Sonia. Um, sometimes they push back because they say this is not town you know, projects. But I think if the council were to look at a policy format for formulation that said CPA should prioritize these things as, in a, as, a, as a blanket statement to the CPA to give them guidance in their decision making, it might have some real impact um, in terms of how they prioritize their decision making. Thank you. So where where are we other than we are at 8.30 for sure, um, or 8.33. Um, I think we've gone around and we've done most of FY22. And what I don't know is whether people wanna take a vote on um, a set of recommendations. Um, Sean is taking notes and we can feed them back in terms of recommendations, you know, looking at this master list, um, whether we're basically voting to accept the list as proposed with these two, these two or three areas to be re-examined um, or not. So I'm looking for any kind of how to get us to the next step. And we will, and then we can write, can write this up and, you know, in a draft format so people can look at it next week. But I did want to also spend, I see your hand, Peter. I also want to spend just a little bit of time on the next four years. So Mandy raised the CPA, whether there are any items looking out in those out years. And I have just purely one that Andy mentioned last time on a, not calling everything cash capital, making the table a little bit clearer. And that's just nomenclature. Um, yeah, so there, were, there were a lot of formatting. You know, the first when we presented the capital improvement program, there were a lot of formatting recommendations and suggestions. So we'll we don't need to include those now, but we'll factor right. all those things in when we update it. Okay, so Peter. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 happy to take a vote. I think tonight it would be a little hard without seeing what we've talked about updated in front of us. But um, you know, I'm I'm willing to give it a whirl. It's after eight thirty, my brain turns a little mushy, but yep. you know. 
we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, and, and then my one bit of feedback, and I'm not sure whether which whether this falls in this fiscal year or the next five fiscal years, but on this this topic of, of what we put on the pending list. Um, so um, one of our first meetings, I had brought up concern about putting the Crocker Farm feasibility study on that. Um, and uh, I just wanted to raise that again, but, um, but really the distinction here for me is, 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 is making it very clear um, the things that we've studied versus the things that have been decided on and approved, right? And so if it's, it, the town can do a feasibility study, which means uh, evaluating what's possible and adding some cost estimates to it for anything, right? You could do, could we add a planetarium addition to the Jones, which I would be totally in support of, by the way. Um, but then that would, you know, the town would, would receive that. It would be FYI information. And then it would sit on a shelf until the appropriate body had reviewed and approved it. And like planetarium case would be the library trustees, right? And so we wouldn't, we wouldn't put it in, um, in a public document that says, this is in the queue, it just needs funding um, or just some planning before the appropriate body had discussed and green and greenlit it and and that's that's the case for the Crocker farm feasibility study which was a very helpful study it's it's already helped informed our uh, our capital plan uh, but includes a lot of things um, including a, uh, an expansion that the school committee hasn't spent any time talking about or discussing at all and um, so it it's uh, it's confusing to have it on a list of items that that are, are pending like that um, and I just want to be really clear because this comes up on occasion is that I think it's totally fine for members of the public who already feel one way or the other on one or more of the items in any feasibility study, including this one, to advocate for that. And that's like very healthy civic engagement. Um, and and I'm, I'm not suggesting we take it off the pending list because I am against it. And I'm not expressing that I'm for it either. I'm, I'm trying to be very neutral here because my whole committee hasn't discussed it at all. Um, so I just think from a process point of view, um, it, it's, it's better situated not being uh, on that list. So I can, thank you. So that is, that's in this, not just the five-year capital plan, but that other initial table that, that Sean gave us on the, what else is out there um, as, as a list. So that is, also a decision whether that becomes part of this larger document or if that's the uh, town manager will, I mean, we're advising the town manager and he will have this larger capital plan. So what I've heard on FY22 um, as a package that we could vote on tonight is that you know there's the long list and that we're comfortable with that list where we, with one exception in terms of possibly increasing it, and that's the sustainability fund. And we either want more information or we want better justification of the North Amherst intersection. You know, how are, near are we? And do we really need that money now um, for the study? And if, if we're not near, um, you know, in terms of getting a grant, if we do that to potentially remove that or decrease it. And otherwise I haven't really heard anything um, about that. So if those, if that is the package, then I think we could say that is what we're, you know, there's a long list for FY22, but that's what we could be recommending for 22 with these qualifications. So does anyone, so I'm making that as, as the list, yeah, Sean. So I would love a vote. Um... But we didn't have a vote on the agenda, so I don't know if that matters. Um, you know, we didn't at the at the next meeting we specifically have a vote on the agenda, but um, tonight it was just discussion. So I didn't know, you know, if voting would. Well, can we do if we didn't say a vote on the agenda? Can we go around the room and just get a sense of is there general agreement for that? I think so that's the, the better way to go. Because then we could begin a draft to know that we were there and then we could be looking at that draft. So is that a way of doing it? So it's an informal, you can, you can change your mind next week where we take a formal vote on it. Um, so I don't know whether an informal, Paul, Paul is raising his hand on, you know, I've seen CPA do kind of straw vote that isn't a binding vote on it, but. So, so certainly you can do that. You do not have to have, you, the only thing the agenda has to have is the topic that you're gonna discuss. You can take an action, you can take a motion on it or not. You don't need to have the motion on the agenda if you don't want. 
Okay. So Paul is giving us permission to, to move ahead on this tonight <laughs> rather than, so um, I could put that back in a formal motion or you could just say, you know, Kathy said, you know, we're taking, it's the, my motion is the FY22 that was proposed to us with two areas um, that we want to look at. One is should sustainability go up more and we're questioning the North Amherst intersection, not because we don't think it should be done, but are we really ready to spend that money um, to then secure a grant in the following year? Do we think we're, we're that ready? And I would add just, is that amount of money the right amount of money to be asking for it? So that's my, my um, motion of the package we're voting on. Um, Peter, is that a, a more discussion? Um, your hand is so up. On the question of should we vote tonight or not, um... My, I guess my preference is not to because okay. so Paul is Paul's correct that that you don't that you don't need I'm not disagreeing with Paul Paul Paul's correct that you, that open meeting law you don't you don't need to have there's no OML requirement that has to say vote it's more it's more con, well in, in my experience on committees it's more convention to to broadcast and publicize to the public what what is about to happen right so like we often have you know X parentheses discussion one meeting and then X parentheses possible vote the next so it's just a way to to, to um, signal to the public what the action is. I don't think there's anything really wrong with it, but if, if the only purpose is to get a straw poll consensus and, the, and, and we can move forward anyway, I mean, we might as well just, but I mean, I'm, I'm happy to be overruled. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm fine. I'm basically fine. I don't see any disagreement. So I can, you know, no one is saying don't do this. So we can, what Sean and I can do, can, we can write this up and feed this back to you that this is what we're going to be looking at when we come back together next week, when we take a formal vote um, and, uh, and, and then can start the draft. It, it sounds like if, if we can't have a decent full draft of a full report by next week, um, we can write it with blanks, um, then we, may have, to, we, we ha may have to meet the following week if people want to see a draft. Um, to get a report out so that we've done that hold. So are people comfortable with that? Because we didn't, Mandy looked at the next four years and made a comment on CPA and that's something we can write in. And I, my, I have a couple questions on the formatting of the report itself because Sean has grouped things a little differently than before and I do like it. So it's a question of, you know, exactly what the tables and the staff will be preparing the tables. We don't have to do that. Um, so Andy. Just question as to what's up with the, then if we made a decision on the citizens request. Oh, that, that was the one I wanted to raise. I would like to recommend that positively. Um, and I thought what Mandy had raised as could it be um, focused on the parking lots that are not the regional school parking lots and have the regional budget, which is talking about a solar study focus on the regional. And I thought that was a reasonable way of doing it. So Andy, you're asking whether we're recommending positively. And I guess the second is, is it extra or does it come out of the sustainability pot? And yeah, Sean. And again, my question is, do we want to allocate money to something that we are pursuing a pursuing a grant for. Um, again, we um, Stephanie is you know working on a grant that we've had some positive um, feedback on that would provide the resources to do this type of study. So, so potentially, if we increase the sustainable sustainability line item, you know, it could come out of there if we don't get the grant. I guess the question is, do we want to, or do you want to recommend increasing some of one one of the items? and acknowledge that we're pursuing a grant. And if we get the grant, then we would not spend that money. If people were comfortable, we could write it that way, that we're increasing the sustainability budget. We look favorably on this proposal um, and are not earmarking it right now because we think there's a grant possibility, but we're encouraging it, that money be spent for this. If the grant doesn't come through, would be a way of writing that up. Does that work? I'm seeing people nodding, yeah, thumbs up, okay. Well, thank you everyone. Um, so I, uh, Alex, yes, whoops, it, muted. 
damn it, I wanted to go a meeting without doing that. Um, on the recommendation to increase the sustainability, are we recommending them? I mean, like as it is, we're fifteen thousand dollars off the like. What is that again? What does that mean? Like, if we are recommending an increase to the sustainability budget, are we basically giving a direction of like, hey, Paul and Sean, go back, figure out that fifteen grand, and while you're at it, we think you should bump the budget, do it as you see fit, in the amount you see it fit from where you see fit. Like, what are what are we suggesting? Sean, so again, I think there's going to be sort of a a couple steps we're going to take to look to how to close that gap. Um, one, as I mentioned, we'll look at the copiers, we'll look at the computers. Um, and then the, the last place, or maybe the first place we'll also look is what Sonia mentioned earlier about some of the old articles that could be closed out and, and put to close this gap for this year. So if you come back to us next week with that information, then we can be, what Alex is asking, we can be more specific because yeah. If you find us another fifty thousand dollars, then we can say a hundred. You know, because because of these, is is that a way we can go? So we don't have to be vague. Yeah, no, I can definitely get. Um, I I should be able to get specifics on all those. Yeah. Okay. That sounds like a good plan to me. Okay. Well, we've. It's quite a. Um, it's a been a very good discussion, I think. And I will send, I will share with Sean my notes, but then I will do a feedback. I think Andy used to do that with JCPC, that this was the discussion tonight. This is what we heard. And then you'll have it in notes coming back before you come next week, in addition to the minutes. Um, and um, then maybe a beginning of draft of a report. So I, I'm in charge of doing a beginning draft. So we'll see how far I can get. And Alex has kindly offered last year to be the second reader. And I promise you it's gonna be closer this time because it's clearer to me what to write. <laughs> so, so I think we can say we're adjourned unless, and, oh, I need to look public comments to see if we have, uh, we have no attendees. We probably outlasted them. I forgot to look earlier. Um, so then seeing no public, I think we have no public comments and there is no late breaking news. So we are adjourned for this evening and see you next week. Good night. Good night. Thank you.